Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to today's Wired Foresight Briefing. I'm Greg Williams. I'm the editor of Wired. Welcome along to today's virtual briefing, the latest in a series of conversations with leading figures and innovative thinkers in business, science, technology, academia and policy to really investigate the changes that the coronavirus has brought upon us, to explore how the world will change in the coming months and years, and most importantly, to try and understand how we can prepare for those changes. We intend that the live virtual briefings are punchy, top-level sessions with a guest speaker on a key topic or theme. Each starts with a brief introduction from the speaker, goes into a discussion with an ed editor, and is followed by a Q&A session with your questions. We know you're busy, but you want concise, authoritative briefings, so these discussions will last no more than 25 minutes. Now on to the session. The ongoing COVID-19 pandemic is clearly a global health emergency, but it's also an economic crisis. We've seen millions of workers put on furlough or losing their jobs, markets in free fall, and entire industries such as airline, travel and hospitality put on hold. Just in the past 24 hours, we've seen an extension of the government's extraordinary aid package and news that the UK economy shrank at the fastest monthly place, pace on record in March as the lockdown triggered a crash in activity and demand. Today, we'll discuss how economies have responded to extreme stress tests, including major disaster, failure and complete rebuild. To understand how governments, business and local communities have coped with extraordinary situations and the resilience and innovation that have followed. With that, I'm delighted to introduce our guest speaker, Richard Davis, the author of Extreme Economies, which looks at nine vastly different economies facing extraordinary stress related to survival and failure. Richard is an economist based in London and is currently a fellow at the LSE. He's been an economic advisor to the Chancellor of the Exchequer and Chair of the Council of Economic Advisors at the Treasury and an economist and speechwriter at the Bank of England. Richard, great to have you with us today. Um, just to kick things off, could you please give us a quick overview of your work and, and share a bit about extreme economies? Yes, um, Greg, thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, listen, the project really started about four years ago in, in 2016, um, and it stemmed from a worry um, and a kind of growing sense of anxiety on my part which came from the fact that as economists, I just thought we were missing a huge chunk of how life really works for people. Um, I'd had a really interesting, but you could say very formal or mainstream career in economics, so advising policymakers, working as a journalist. But when it came uh, to really predicting things, to really understand what was going on, we were clearly missing something. So we missed the financial crisis of 2008, and we also missed this kind of turn against international trade with concern over the EU here, but the rise of trade wars in the US, for example, and populism elsewhere. And I think the fact we're missing these huge events matters. And it matters because we know for a fact, and this is an important argument I make in the book, that three big trends are going to affect the economy uh, of, of the next 10 to 20 years. So the economy of 2030 is increasingly elderly as life expectancy rises and birth rates fall. It's technologically advanced, in particular with the digitization of the modern state. And it's increasingly unequal, particularly as large emerging markets um, become mature and incomes in those countries diverge. And we know that these things are going to have uh, economic impacts. Uh, they're on the horizon. They're definitely going to test our resilience. Yet again, as economists, we kept missing things. And, and this made me worried. So I decided to write a book with a very different approach based on travel and a lot of interviews about how resilience really works. So the book's really all about resilience. And as I was sort of starting to think about this, one day I was talking to um, somebody, a friend who works as a prison governor, prison governor here in the UK. And she was explaining how in every prison, there's a sophisticated underground economy, often even with its own currency that it runs on. And it struck me that this was a, a type of resilience. You know, how do you build an economy when you have literally nothing? So I decided to try and find more examples of specific places where resilience played out. These are places economists don't go, um, but they're places where I thought we might learn something. And so I've got them on a map. So on the first map, 
we have three examples of uh, extreme survival. So I went to Aceh, the northern tip of Indonesia. It was a place destroyed by the 2004 tsunami to talk to villagers about how they rebuild their lives. I went to refugee camps in northern Jordan to talk to Syrian families about how they managed um, during the, the Syrian civil war when they fled. And I went to Louisiana, which is the most incarcerated state in the US, to see economic resilience inside the prison system. So all of these first three places are where, kind of against all the odds, people are able to build an economy. The next map has three places which are examples of failures of resilience. These are places that should have flourished but have done terribly. So it's a kind of flip side of the first three examples, if you like. Uh, the Darien Gap is a place that few have heard of today, but 400 years ago, particularly in the UK, it was famous. It, sh it should be a trading hub, but it's ended up a kind of lawless wilderness um, in which economics is involved in a, in a devastating environmental failure. Um, I went to Kinshasa because you know, the, the Democratic Republic of the Congo is easily the biggest economic tragedy of the past 100 years on any measure, mineral wealth, location, the potential for hydroelectric power. Um, it is, it, on the kind of textbook analysis, it should be an amazing economy, but it's one of the worst performing. And then to Glasgow here in the UK, you know, it's almost been forgotten that 120 years ago, Glasgow was seen as a genuine rival to London. It was the site of incredible industry and innovation and artistic endeavor. But by the 1960s, it was easily Britain's most problematic city. So these first trips were two sides of a coin in a way when it comes to resilience. So tests of resilience that people had overcome, um, extremes of success, and then extremes of shocking failure. And then I took what I'd learned um, to places which, which I think are kind of emblematic cities of the future, um, to Tallinn, this is the third map, um, to Tallinn, um, which is Estonia's capital, a place where the government has hardwired digital and tech into every aspect of people's lives. Um, to Akita, uh, Japan's front line of the old age society and a place where when you step off the train, you're just struck immediately by how old everyone is. And then finally to Santiago, the capital city of the world's most unequal country, Chile, and following an economic model that many emerging economies are following. And the task in all of these nine places really was to examine resilience, how it worked, how it failed, and the lessons we might learn for today. Thank, thank you, uh, Richard, for that, for that overview. Um, you certainly must have done a lot of air miles. Um, yeah. I, I, some really interesting examples there in terms of, of resilience and, and also I love the idea that you're looking to the future. Is the kind of the real challenge that we're facing at the moment, the fact that obviously these are all examples of things that are happening in specific locations and specific times, but at the moment what we're facing in terms of resilience is, is something that the entire world is facing almost at the same moment. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the key things I kind of wanted to get across with the book is that tests of our resilience can happen anywhere. Um, think of the, the, the most um, the example that's closest to home. You know, if you'd been in Glasgow in about sort of 1910, say, no one would have imagined that they were so close to a fundamental unwinding of their economic model. And so I wanted to get across the idea that, you know, that living in all these extraordinary places are, are normal people and that all of us would do well to remember that, um, that our own lives are, are somewhat on the edge. And so, yeah. you know, extreme events can happen everywhere. What I did, what I did not predict, um, because the book came, was written obviously before the crisis, is that they could happen everywhere all at once. Um, and I still think that, that uh, so it just made it even more kind of acute, this need to understand in a sort of fundamental human sense, you know, what do we really need from our economy? Um, and what perhaps can we do without? Um, because so many countries are tested by it, by it today. Sure. Uh, it's interesting, the example you, uh, you used um, about K Kinshasa and also, I guess, um, in Louisiana, we're talking about very informal marketplaces in the, in the prison, Angola prison in Louisiana, as well as formal ones. Um, how should we be looking maybe to these informal marketplaces in terms of the, the future challenges that we're going to be encountering? I think there are two big things. Um, the first one is that I... Like again, I mentioned in my intro, but my, my sort of um, 
the way I was brought up and trained, if you want, as an economist, is in incredibly formal. Um, the sort of usual route that somebody ends up working at the Treasury or the Bank of England faces. And um, we're trained to kind of look at official data um, and that data is on kind of companies that we understand and so on. And of course, there's a really important um, role for that. That's, but, but, but what I came to think after, after the, the, doing these trips is it's sort of half of the picture. And the other half is this huge informal economy. So it's street hawkers, yes, in Kinshasa, on the streets of Kinshasa, wherever you commute from and go to, you can buy literally anything on the way home. Um, you know, suits, haircuts, uh, any, any kind of consumer good. And all of this activity is informal. It's outside of the, the official statistics. Similarly, um, the way people build an economy in a prison, I mean, that's completely underground, you know, not measured, it's a, it's a hidden economy. You see the same thing in refugee camps. And so I think the first lesson is that resilience, this sort of ability and need to trade and to exchange and to improve our lives is often informal and it's often missed by the kind of analysis that, that we, we see that the, that the official bodies do. So informality, is actually the stuff of resilience. And the second point, which is really closely related, is that because our data and because our analysis, you, you mentioned in your intro, we've had you know, new shocking figures out from the ONS today. Those, those data focus on exactly the companies who are willing to respond to the ONS and give them their, and, and tell them what's going on in the economy. Mm. And, that means we're only looking at half the picture and, and literally when you the IMF has done some work on this and in, in some, some countries including India for example our official statistics may be measuring literally just half of the economy so there's this other half which is informal it's kind of micro low level um, we don't measure it and it's also this what I have seen across the world and that is the place where people remain resilient in, in really tough times yeah, I was going to ask you about this. Clearly, formal methods of, of measurement, we just don't take into to, to account informal economies. Presumably, they are going to be impacted significantly, but we'll, we'll never know uh, how much, right? There are, there are really advanced um, and really cool, actually, ways to measure informal activity, a lot of it kind of using tech. So, you know, some on the fringes of economics, some people are interested in this, and they do really cool stuff, for example, using satellite imagery. Mm. Um, and, uh, and, and, and kind of machine learning to, to take pictures of, of the earth and basically say, okay, like we're over a, a city or a, a town here and the official data shows there's kind of this much activity, but when we compare the light usage there and the, and the um, probable energy usage compared to other places, you know, there might be this much economic activity and that missing gap um, is the informal economy. So there are, economists are trying to, um, get hold and, and, and start trying to increasingly measure the informal economy but in the main in the main it's not what we do and I think because of that we're missing important facets of resi resilience. Sure and, and, and thinking about um, refugee camps thinking about prisons in, in extreme situations presumably not everyone benefits I'm interested to get a sense from you in terms of your research what did that teach you about the balance between a Kind of completely open free market and maybe you know a, a more controlled you know command, kind of con, command and control economy well look, it's, a, it's a huge question um i guess it's sort of the question in that you know economists have been trying to answer for the, the past <laughs> couple of hundred hundred years um but i do have some 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 observations i mean and and, and perhaps that kind of relate to what we're going through now the first is that um the starting point, I think, should be that people are able to set up markets and to trade in ways that tend to make things better it, almost instantly, like not fast, but like super, super fast. And so for an example of that, Aceh, the, the region I went to in northern Indonesia, had a yeah. huge aid, aid effort. Obviously, the UN did a lot. The international donors did a lot. Actually, the first people that were to open were these gold traders. The Achenese save and insure themselves by wearing gold bangles. And the um, gold traders opened immediately, sent that gold down to Jakarta in exchange for money. And that was used as seed capital, essentially, for local entrepreneurs. And so 
people are way quicker at adapting and at setting up new forms of commerce than we yeah. think. Yeah, yeah. A, a related point is that it, it also allowing people to do that actually is much more than an, an economic step. So, and I saw this most clearly, I guess, in the Zatari refugee camp, which is that, you know, the, the ability to trade and to access new forms of fashion, um, really importantly in that refugee camp is bicycles. So these, there are no cars in refugee camps, so there are bicycles. And there's a huge trade in sort of souping up and coloring and adding uh, bells and whistles to your bicycle. And after a, a while, I realized what was going on is, you know, that's one of the only ways they have to show individuality and to show taste and also to show success and kind of who's cool and so on. Um, and so th the, um, the ability to trade isn't just there, but there's actually a need um, and to sort of satisfy this, you know, some psychologists call it the, the, the need for self-actualization, to making some, make something different of yourself. Yeah. And you, that becomes even more important when you're in a kind of um, disastrous situation. And to sort of, you know, jump through a few steps, I've become more interested in policies that in situations like now actually just give people cash. And um, so unconditional direct cash aid to people on the basis that they are often able to make very good decisions, including setting up new companies and trading to their advantage. Right. And, and do you think that it's changed the, d the debate about UBI and that maybe more uh, governments are going to be thinking about this seriously? I think that for sure, um, what we're going through in a way is a kind of test of a UBI. Yeah. You know, there was all the, um, the, the analysis in, in, in yesterday with um, the, the steps that Rishi Sunak was, the yeah. Chancellor was taking, and just the sheer number of people that implicitly the Treasury is more or less employing. Um, and there are some great examples of people who are furloughed um, and have got their income guaranteed setting up new kind of voluntary artistic um, entrepreneurial things because because of that um that safety yeah so i think it, it is a test of a kind of ubi um my concern has always been with ubi well two first i, I actually just don't think benefits should be universal i think they should be targeted on people that need the most but but um more just more practically whatever your sort of philosophy on that I just don't think the numbers add up. If you if you look at what could be a decent income uh, for people and then multiply it by the number of households, number of earners in the UK, you end up with a number that's much higher um, than than um, is achievable through government's expenditure. So, so I think it's it's a test of the UBI idea. I doubt whether it's going to kind of catch on and and people will think it should be applied more widely. Let's maybe just um, go back to the idea of resilience for a second. I was really struck by the the what you said earlier about most of us living closer to an extreme than we could have imagined with the example yeah. of Glasgow, which was fascinating. Obviously, organisations, governments, individuals are all now thinking about you know resilience. It's, it's one of the hot topics. But obviously, the global economy is wide ranging. It's incredibly diverse. How do you build resilience into a really complex systems? The, the, sort of, the sort of easy answer of that trying to evade the question is you yeah. need sort of site specific and case by case um, yeah. um, analysis. And in a way, actually, that's not the easy answer for, for economists because one of the things I sort of did with this book is a completely different approach to what I, I normally do in my sort of current research or um, previously when advising, which is sort of take an economic model, take a load of data and come up with a policy idea. And those policy ideas tend to be one size fits all. So think of UBI, think of um, another popular things that may like a wealth tax or whatever. The people talking about those are thinking about those as sort of global solutions. And um, one of the things that I'm convinced um, of the book, a bit like the divide between the official data we have and then this big hidden economy, is that economists, as economists and policy makers, we need to get out on the ground and talk to people about the differences in their um, individual situation. Yeah. So I did over 500 interviews for the book, and yeah. that's, you know, sizably more than anything I'd ever done as, a, as an official policy advisor. So uh, as a, like a, uh, 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 one answer to your question is, I don't think there is one size or 
fits all policy and moreover i think economists should stop trying to look for one right. um, and, and, and by extension does that mean you know when we think about globalization presumably the world isn't flat any longer it's it's quite bumpy and there's there's different you know as you say there's different sort of scenarios uh, in different kind of complex ecosystems throughout the world yeah, m m massively so. But just to, to, to link that back to, um, to, your, to your previous question, there isn't one, si one size all fits policy. However, I've become more um, sort of interested in the almost sort of like psychological and social um, mm. link between the, between the economy and commerce like the market in terms of not not in terms of the thinking of you know um uh, the, the london kind of city markets but you know a local market where people come to trade and that idea is is hugely important for people and as a result I, there are some well there's not a one size fits all there are some things that we should be really careful of um and one i mean just struck me from from speaking to all the people at, at glasgow is you know and it sounds simple, but companies are owned and run by people. And if there's some event happens that's going to cause your companies to fail, um, then you want to try and avoid that, whatever country you are, and where, whatever type of globalization you are. So if you look back at Glasgow, I think it's one of the British state's biggest failures um, of the past 150 years. That is to allow shipbuilding, our shipbuilding industry, to com be completely eviscerated. And the effects of that lasted, last even to, to today in Glasgow. Mm. And so what that means is suppose, uh, you know, the treasury, they were thinking, okay, we've got a pot of money of a certain amount that we think we're going to use to bail out companies. That should be like the bottom of your estimate, because when you take into effect the psychological, the emotional damage that's done by people who have built something, it's become um, their life. And the way that echoes, which we can see in our, in a, you know, in my research at the LSE, you can see how failures of firms echoes over 10, 15 year periods. You want to really try and protect industry from these kind of extraordinary shocks if you can. And by extension, do you think we're going to see more or increased you know, localized manufacturing, more localized production, and move away from these sprawling supply chains, chains in just in time to more sort of a you know a just in case economy. It's being described so uh, much more focus on this kind of localized production. Yeah, I've I've been reading all all of this stuff, and um, it strikes me as a little bit. Um, uh, I would be, I, I put it this way, I'd be surprised. I'd be pretty surprised. Um, right. why, why is that? Um, just to give a sim simple vignette of why that is. Um, in the Zaatari refugee camp, so this is in Northern Jordan, people who fled the Syrian civil war, they have absolutely nothing. Um, within, uh, within months, a local entrepreneur from, from the villages that had fled had set up a fashion store. And it's the, it was there within that refugee camp, it was their equivalent of Primark or something you could get. Men's and women's clothes, jackets, kids' clothes, all different types, changing with the seasons, importantly. Right? You might think that people that become refugees sort of, you know, just want to stay warm. No, they want to kind of express themselves through fashion. So what do I take from that? The idea that some shock is going to come and hit us and then we're going to suddenly not be interested in fast fashion, which is ultimately what's it doing? It's letting, letting us express our tastes and desires as consumers yeah. in, on one part. And the other part of fast fashion is just that people in different parts of the world have very low wages. And so, it's, and so firms find it um, uh, profit maximizing to, to locate there. I think those two things are really, really strong forces. And um, the idea that, that this um, virus and this recession, devastating as it is, will, um, will completely change that in us. I just wonder if that's the case. You know, it isn't the case in any of these people who I've been to see across the world that themselves faced really big, big shocks that you might think make, want to make them more local. No, they wanted to go back to exactly the way things were before. That's interesting. So it's almost like an inbuilt resilience in human beings by, by, by almost by nature. 
Yeah, um, I think I think that people, of course, there are some things, food, food supply, and so on, which would be better for the environment, and so on. And, and, and so I'm not seek, seeking to sort of denigrate that idea. Yeah. Um, and I'm and and um, in many ways, environmentally, in terms of carbon footprints, it, it would be very good. I'm just saying that there's actually an inbuilt human thing to rebuild precisely the economy we had before because in doing so it's a way of um, refusing to admit defeat that makes total sense yeah and and i think says a lot about the human beings um i'm being told that we should move to q a now okay okay with you i don't know if you can see those questions i can uh, in front of you great so if there's you know maybe you know two or three that you'd like to sort of pick out and uh, you think are, are particularly interesting or you'd like to take on in terms of uh, talking about lessons from your book. So David Wood says, what was the cause of the large decline of fortune in Glasgow's economy? Are there lessons for this for us today? Yeah, absolutely. So um, Glasgow was built um, on shipbuilding. So it's an example of a city that has one absolutely core industry big lesson for us today because if you look across the world there are loads of cities that have a kind of central uh, central industry and in short what happened was um, the, the policy makers um, pretty much missed out or misread the facts something that we now um, as economists call the benefits of agglomeration and that means that when one firm goes to a place, it creates these unseen benefits for other firms in terms of creating a skilled labor force, um, supply chains and innovation. And these three, these three kind of forces make a town and a place stronger. Um, it's something that Alfred Marshall wrote about, Paul Krugman's also written about. But what we failed to realize is that the reverse is true. So if you start letting a place fail and firms move away, you get all these unseen hits and unseen damage um, to, to other uh, companies and so again that's an example of if you can um, uh, for an activist industrial policy so so in general it's it's best for uh, experience shows that it's best um, not to delve too much into specifics of, of managing industries but in some cases and Glasgow was one of them and now now would be another example you want a really really activist industrial policy to 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 head off those those losses uh, anonymous says it's quite interesting is there a set of discernible features in the successful instances of resilience and do you see patterns of behavior um, so yes for sure um, so the the main place um, i saw this uh, was in the three kind of su success economies i called them and the two two things two really striking things completely different. One um, is the ability to um, be flexible with your human capital. And what I mean by that is that um, to take the, the, the Zartary refugee camp, which has thousands of companies set up in it, none of the people doing there were doing exactly what they did at home. So the guy that runs the main um, uh, bike shop there was actually a car mechanic. This guy that I mentioned before that runs the kind of Zartary Primark, if you like, um, was a wholesaler back in Syria and basically what they showed was human capital is also a really important part of resilience because um, what, when a, a natural disaster or a war can come and hit a place it doesn't damage the ideas the innovation the skills often the networks that people have and so the ability to take that human capital and put it to work in a new place was it was a key thing something we haven't um, discussed at all now ho hopefully some people might like to look at the book if they're interested in this the other pattern of behavior that's really fascinating actually because there are new ways of trading new patterns of trade they're often in these places new currencies so people inventing new ways of exchanging money either through these bizarre hidden currencies that work in um, louisiana prisons or sort of more barter economies using ingots of gold or even powdered milk so when your economy doesn't work for you you rebuild a new one and one of the patterns behavior that i saw in some places was the invention of a new currency it's extraordinary and what actions yeah. do you think private businesses and smes can tell can take to help stimulate the economy right now what i saw um across the board was the 
the the importance of self um built uh sort of restarting of, of companies and particularly of small business and when you look um so again uh in kinshasa for example which in terms of again there's an official official and reality thing there in terms of the official data the economy is um the company has very few firms and um you imagine that the economy would be really weak as you arrive and kind of land on the ground um it's a it's a massive hub of activity um and uh the it just shows how, how important very very small firms sort of one and two people um almost self-incorporation is in times of um extreme strain in terms of what should happen right now during the current um covid situation the the main thing um and this is this is very difficult and it will be diff different sector by sector but if there's one lesson that i saw in all these places is the ability to very quickly like overnight stop doing one thing that doesn't work and do a different thing and yeah. so we're seeing that from loads of companies you know the move to online versus going to restaurants but anybody that um thinks that uh that they have an idea to alter the way they're operating these people that are really pushed right to the edge in these very extreme situations do that almost instantaneously often to, to a deal of success so so that would be the key lesson for now i think great richard thank you so much um absolutely fascinating conversation i uh, can say to everyone who's joined us today thank you for that but please do um, take a look at richard's book i can highly recommend it extreme economies is available uh, at the moment uh, from your uh, local uh, high street uh, bookseller um, and if you enjoyed today, please do check out the rest of the Wired Foresight series. We have Candid Decisions with economist Rebecca Hendenson, trust expert Rachel Botsman, um, future of work experts Helen Tupper and Sarah Ellis, surgeon and VR pioneer Shafi Ahmed, many more, all available at wired.co.uk. In the meantime, Rich, thank you so much. Uh, we'll be sharing details of the talk with everyone uh, after this, and maybe if you're uh, okay with it we'll share a way of contacting you so you can maybe uh, get into a discussion with some of the people who were uh, part of the chat today in the meantime everyone stay safe and we'll see you soon thank you so much <laughs>